Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the second annual Taoist Conference, the post-pandemic world, visions of the Tao for the modern world, hosted by the Taoist Gate Center. Our next speaker today is Deng Ming Dao. Deng Ming Dao, through his teachings and especially his writing, has served as an accessible introduction for so many to Taoism. If you're in communities that practice Taoism or internal martial arts, you probably already know his work. I remember some years ago, uh, Jamie actually uh, said to me at one point, because we were talking, he was, I think, maybe quoted something from his book, and he goes, you've never heard of Deng Ming Dao? And it was just unthinkable. Um, and that just goes to show how wide-reaching uh, his work really is. Uh, master storyteller. You can see by his writing he, that he really humbly lives what he preaches. Uh, his words often feel like the generation before us passing on their wisdom. Chapter four of the Tao Te Ching says, the way is empty, but use will not drain it. Ming Dao's writings often feel just like that inexhaustible resource, directing us to our own well of inspiration that can never be used up. He writes of the Tao that exists in everyday life, using words as mirrors to reflect us back into the present moment, reminding us that our transcendence could not possibly take place anywhere else. So, Deng Ming Dao, please take it away. I, I met Sam and Rosie, the organizers, and I'm grateful to them for everything that they've done. And I gather from the opening remarks that they had much help as well. So I'm appreciative of that. I also want to acknowledge Josh Painter and Lindsay Wei, who are my co-speakers during this conference. They also are going to give you or have given you as well a um, tremendous amount of information and guidance. And finally, I want to acknowledge all of you and thank you for being here today. And I hope that we can have a good discussion together. The topic is what do we do about this pandemic um, given our interest in Taoism? And I think we need to start first with the idea of what Tao is. And if you look at the Chinese word, it's a picture of a face and walking. But can we look at that even more closely? That means it's a person. So they're describing this cosmological phenomenon in terms of a person. It's not something distant, say, like the word for heaven. It's something intimate. But that person is walking. So that means that person has to walk on the ground. And they have to walk under the sky. So that's what we all have to do. We have to journey and make our way through this world, but we make our way through this world that is heaven and earth. And for the Taoist, heaven and earth are the complete setting for our existence, but they are a dynamic pair. Heaven initiates, earth receives. What heaven starts, earth has to nurture. And notice that earth has the power to regenerate everything. Everything dies. And when it dies, it falls to earth. And when it falls to earth, earth remakes it into something new. There is grass growing on every tomb. So we live in this marvelous world. Heaven and earth have their Tao, their path. People have their Tao, their path, but notice that they're not the same. Why are they not the same? Heaven and earth act in ways, two ways that we cannot. First, heaven and earth do things without any pre-planning, no intention, no consciousness at all. Everything that it does, heaven and earth together, it does, and that's it. Whatever happens is the next step. The other issue is that heaven and earth continue forever. They have infinite amount of time to work everything out. Now, in contrast to that, we cannot follow that. We do not keep up with this world 
in real time. We have to look, we have to perceive, we have to process, we have to think about what we're going to do, and then we have to try it out. Already by that time, how many innumerable changes has heaven and earth gone through? So there's always a problem of synchronization. The next thing is we have limited lifespans. We don't have an infinite amount of time to work everything out. And so we have to be thoughtful, intentioned. We have to try to eliminate as many problems as possible. And one of the most significant problems is our own shortcomings. And that's why we have to engage in self-cultivation and training in order to make the most use of our time on this planet. If heaven and earth have their Tao, and people have their Tao, the challenge is for people to match their Tao with the cosmological Tao. Things happen in heaven and earth. We have to respond and act. The mistake is to think that we can run things, change things, dominate the world, we cannot. Heaven and earth are infinite. We are not. How can one conqueror, no matter how powerful, possibly change heaven and earth? And that's one of the follies that we have to try to eliminate in our own self-cultivation. So we have this situation where we have to act. We're interested in the Tao. We want to follow it. And now what happens when outer circumstances are not favorable to us? And that's the case with the pandemic. I don't think there's anybody here who wants to say, oh, it was fine with me, or a pandemic is okay. It was and still continues to be a significant and traumatic event throughout the world. Many people have died many people got sick. It led to all sorts of political debates about the efficacy of vaccination and so on. It led to questions about our personal and social responsibility. Should we wear a mask? Even if we don't want to wear a mask, should we wear a mask for the sake of other people? All these questions came to the fore during the pandemic. So now we have a situation where the universal Tao, the way of the world, was going in one direction. And it just didn't happen to be anything that any of us wanted. It was disruptive. It was difficult. Isn't that the ultimate question about following Tao? Were there opportunities during the pandemic? And I think there were. And maybe this is just me, but I thought, oh, great. You know, I'm going to practice. And whenever this pandemic is over, I want something to show for it. I'm not going to sit there day after day moaning and saying I didn't do anything. And then time goes by. The pandemic will be over, I'm pretty sure. And then what if I had done nothing? So I took the pandemic as an opportunity. Now, I was naive and stupid, which is not unusual for me. In March, I thought, oh, at the most, it'll be over by September. And I, of course, I was wrong. What happened to me is that there was a big impact to my own work. Um, things changed. I wasn't able to travel to teach or anything like that. And there was a lot of time. So I did invest that time in practice. This leads to that question. When outer circumstances deny you a favorable life, what do you do? Do you give in to that and say, oh, it's bad luck, the world is against me, I can't do anything? 
Or do you look and see what you can do with that time? The essence of Taoism is to take everything, good or bad, and turn it to your advantage. And if you read through Chinese literature, the Taoists are always finding surprising ways to achieve something even when everybody says that it's wrong or impossible. That's an important viewpoint of Taoism. They want to look at everything and say, what can I make of this? So even though the classical instruction is that we take our personal Tao and we meld it with the universal Tao and that we defer and give in to the Tao, it doesn't mean that you are passive. It means that you take the opportunities that are in front of you and you choose from those opportunities, maybe even combine them in ways that are imaginative and unusual, and you still find the right path for yourself. And this is okay because it's accepting the circumstances that you're given. And as long as you can accept the circumstances that you're given, you are then supposed to take the details of those circumstances and make something of them. So should you find yourself in a situation that is like the pandemic, where life is overwhelmingly against you, there are always going to be chances to make something good of it, if you take the time to look. Yes, I know that people who talk about Taoism, talk about acceptance, talk about non-action, talk about uh, just accepting what heaven and earth gives you, but they're leaving out the second part. You have to take what heaven and earth gives you, and then you have to work on it. Is this in the classics? Yes, because if you read the Tao Te Ching, they're always championing the people, and the people were overwhelmingly agrarian. In all the different personages shown in the Tao Te Ching, from rulers to spirits to demons and so on, the people are always held up as the paragons of virtue. They don't need to learn virtue, they are virtuous. And what do the people do? They work. What does a farmer do? The farmer may plant seeds, but he got those seeds from somewhere. The farmer may plant seeds, but without water and sunlight and the land, those seeds won't grow. The farmer is taking what heaven and earth gives, but then the farmer has to work. So can we see the pandemic as something given to us? Not necessarily a disaster, a calamity, and my life is over, but this is the situation. And now how can we work on it? Now, one of the best guides to all of this is the Yi Jing. And the Yi Jing, the Book of Changes, speaks of misfortune and good fortune. And when I was young, I took those as absolute things. And of course, I only wanted the good fortune. And then if I got a reading that talked about misfortune, it was like, oh, my whole evening was ruined. It's life is going to be terrible. And then when it was good fortune, I thought, oh, great, everything's going to be okay. And then I waited for something to happen. You see, I didn't work with what was given me. What does the Yi Jing tell us? It tells us we can last through misfortune. And what does the Yi Jing tell us? It tells us we have to be careful with good fortune. When times are bad, we are supposed to persevere. We're supposed to seek the errors within ourselves. And we are continually told to be pure. 
what is our pure self? The Taoists would suggest that pure self is one that is without guile, without cleverness, without shrewdness, without trying to dominate others, without being selfish. So we have to be pure in the face of misfortune. We have to be patient and we always have to act. Sometimes those actions may not be spectacular. Sometimes the Yi Jing will say only small things can be done, but something always has to be done. So when times are bad, you have to retreat back into yourself. You have to have faith in yourself. You have to be pure in yourself. And you have to work patiently with circumstances until you can move out of them. What about good fortune? Good fortune isn't necessarily just easy street either. Because when you have good fortune, the I Ching tells us bad fortune is coming. The Tao Te Ching says that bad fortune hides in good and good fortune had, hides in bad. So, as you're facing good fortune, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to share. You're supposed to be careful. And you should take as much of the good fortune as you can and save it and preserve it so that you have some buffer to retreat to when bad fortune comes. So in this way, you can ease and even out the ups and downs of good and bad fortune. In times of bad, you seek the opportunities and you have to be personally pure. In times of good fortune, you have to, of course, acknowledge the good, but share it, save it, and be careful because bad fortune will be coming. In this way, it's not an alternation between good and bad fortune. It's not like my youthful, naive self where, oh, I'm going to try to dodge all the bad fortune or I don't want any bad fortune. I'll only take the good. And then when bad fortune comes, you say, oh, I had bad luck. It was a problem. I don't know why it happened, and so on. Why does good and bad fortune happen? The I Ching will tell us that they are paired together. The Tao Te Ching says the whole world only knows beauty because of ugliness, that we only know good because of bad. The mistake that I made is that I only wanted one side of the pair. I only wanted the good stuff. But I didn't understand that bad and good always come together. So if that's true, and if we define the pandemic as bad fortune, shouldn't good be coming? And the answer is yes. It has to come, it has to turn, because the I Ching tells us that when something reaches its extreme, it changes to its opposite. How could it be any other way? If a farmer plows and gets to the edge of the field, there's nothing to do but turn around. So when we've reached the limits of good, it has to turn around toward bad. And when we reach the limits of bad, it has to turn around toward good. If you know that that's the way the world works, then you can also take advantage of that. That's why we have to be patient and prudent, whether it's good fortune or whether it's bad fortune. What do we need to do in all this? I would suggest to you 
that it's really important for everybody to have a personal practice. Only through self-cultivation can you really prepare yourself for this world, can you integrate yourself with this world, and can you find good health and happiness. What does it mean to have a personal practice? The word for cultivation is also the word for repair. Don't we all get torn down every day? Don't we find ourselves aging? Don't we find ourselves making mistakes? Don't we find ourselves in need of forgiveness and in need to forgive others? That's a process. So yes, of course, I practice martial arts and Qigong and so on, but it's not just physical. It's an attitude. It's the idea that through your own self-discipline and cultivation, you can face anything that comes to you. Now, we should have a physical practice as well. And it's an unfortunate practice in our society that we divide physical and mental. That doesn't really exist in Taoism. It's not an assumption there. And so your stretching, your martial arts, all the horse stances, the qigong, the weapons work, and so on, this all has a purpose. And that purpose is to remake yourself into somebody stronger and purer. And when you do that, you can face the travails of life. And that's why a time like the pandemic is an opportunity because everybody else is busy, because there was social distancing, because people had to stay home. Well, you can invest that time in practice instead of just sitting there in front of the television. Notice that there's no room for moaning and groaning about how unfair the world is or blah, 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 blah. That's a waste of time. You look to see what's happening and you respond to it. You can learn this lesson very easily through martial arts. If you're sparring with someone or dueling with someone, it's an utter mistake to complain about what the other person is doing. They just threw this punch. You have to respond to it. You can't say, oh my God, why is he hitting me? Right? That's a waste. And that gap in time means you're going to get hit a couple times more. And so this is part of cultivation. This is what you can learn from martial arts too. You don't complain about what your opponent does. You just respond to what your opponent does. And notice this, everything your opponent does might be an attack, but it's also an opening. They have two arms, they have two legs. Nobody can defend every opening. As soon as they attack you, they have to open something up. And that means then you just have to have the training and the cleverness and the reflexes to respond to the opening that's given you. Just like what you need to do with Tao. If something is closed, something else will be open. So rather than complain and whine, look for the opening. Notice that I said in order to be a good martial artist, you have to have perception and cleverness and reflexes. You have to have training. Maybe the first time, well, not maybe, of course the first time you try fighting, you're going to be bad at it. And by the time you get to the hundredth time, you should be better than the first time. And by the time you get to the thousandth time, doesn't it stand to reason you should be better than the last time? Okay. Same thing with Tao. 
Maybe at first you're going to be a little clumsy at it, but the more you work at it, the faster and better you're going to be at responding. That brings us back to training and self-cultivation. You have to have a personal practice and you have to keep practicing no matter what. And a pandemic is not an excuse to slack off on practice. And as I've tried to point out to you, in fact, it's an opportunity to practice more. Do we have any social responsibilities? Because a lot of people think, oh, if I have personal practice, that's all that I need. And indeed, if you read the classics, there's an assumption that someone's personal practice is going to change the world almost by seemingly by emanation. If a person is good, then their community will be good. Now, I'm not sure if I'm a person of that much faith, but if you think about it, how does any community change? They can only change person by person. There's a lot of talk in the United States about voting and people talk about blithely so many millions of votes. But that's millions counted one by one. It happens to be in an election that a question is put before the electorate and the number of ones added together on one side is compared to the ones added together on the other side. But it's still person by person. Why are we so bombarded with advertisements and texts and emails and so on? Because they're trying to get you on their side. One by one. Do we have a social responsibility beyond practice? And I believe we do. And if you read the Tao Te Ching, the Tao Te Ching is always championing the role of the sage. And it's very clear that the sage lives embedded in the community. The sage lives embedded in the community and is almost anonymous. The sage is supposed to lead by being behind. The sage is supposed to conduct themselves by wordless teaching. That means that they teach by example. So what are our social responsibilities as Taoists? It's to live in a community, to show the efficacy of practice, to be an advocate for what's good, and to affect our community in a way that they're not even aware of, but that does improve the community. So we have a social responsibility even in the midst of a pandemic. By showing that we can triumph over the difficulties of a time like that, we can inspire other people. We shouldn't do that with intentionality. We shouldn't do that with the hope of manipulating people or trying to become famous or making ourselves influencer. We just live our life, help those we can, and continue on and everything else will be taken care of. What is good? And in the Tao Te Ching, it says, the sage helps the good person and the sage helps the not good person. Okay. Any of us would say, oh, we should help someone who deserves it. But if the sage should help the not good person, that means the sage should help everybody selflessly and impartially. And in doing that, the sage is only following the example of heaven and earth. 
From the Tao's viewpoint, heaven and earth are impartial. They do not favor anybody. You can't pray to them and say, hey, do me a favor. They don't do anything with intentionality. They don't do anything with thought. And therefore, they can't be propitiated. You can't change their mind because they're not thinking the way a person does. But do you see inside that is a very important fact that people don't talk about. This world is fair. You're not going to get it to do you any favors because you belong to a certain club or ideology or gender or nationality, nothing. This world is fair. And so what's the only thing that makes a difference? Your work. And what's the important work to do? Your self-cultivation. Do you see how good this world is? Everything is given to you by heaven and earth. Air, water, food, land, places to go, warmth. Not a single person could make any of these qualities if they were thrown into some chamber in a vacuum. We are beholden to heaven and earth. And it's a good thing that heaven and earth are good and fair. And so before we start to worry about fortune and misfortune, can we look underneath that and see that actually good and bad are not 50-50 in this existence? Because you can talk about circumstances being favorable and unfavorable. But underneath, on a second-by-second second basis, everything that makes your life good and possible is something that is given to you. So underneath everything, there is goodness. And it makes sense that this world is slightly better than it is bad. Otherwise, we couldn't prosper, we couldn't live long, the population wouldn't keep growing, and so on. So, we actually have a very good world. We actually have a very good opportunity to live well. And all it takes is us to realize and adjust our attitudes so that we can see how good things are. Why is there bad in the world? What's bad for one person could be good for another. You see people who can take, um, say, junk on the street and make something good of it. If somebody understands plants, they can look at something that someone else would dismiss as weeds and realize that it's a vital crop. Good and bad are not objective. Good and bad depend on what you perceive and what you know. That brings us back to learning and self-cultivation again. So let's not get caught up in questions of good or bad. If you have to say this world is mostly good, bad is not objective. It's only bad for some. And if you know how to switch bad to good, it might not necessarily be an objective judgment against you either. How do we keep with Tao in all of this? It's too easy to say, oh, well, just follow Tao, which of course is true. We see the value placed on non-action in the Tao Te Ching. But does it really mean don't do anything? 
does it really mean, oh, I don't have to do anything and heaven and earth are going to give me everything to my delight? Well, you know that's not true. What heaven and earth gives you automatically without you doing is air and water and food and gravity and place and everything. Yes, heaven and earth brings you all sorts of stuff without you, quote, deserving it. But is it going to bring you a career, a spouse? You have to go out and do things and work for it too. We keep with Tao by accepting what heaven and earth does. And when heaven and earth move, they move supremely and inexorably. And we simply match ourselves to that. One example are the seasons. You have to plant roughly in spring and you harvest in the fall. If you do that, you are working with the Tao of heaven and earth. You are still prospering and you are following in the way that you ought to. When you start to get into questions like technology, let's say, oh, I can now invent a greenhouse and all this supporting technology so I don't have to just plant in the spring and harvest in the fall. Maybe that's marvelous. Maybe that's impressive. Maybe it's a true testament to the abilities that people have. But it risks throwing off the balance of things. And isn't that what has gotten us into trouble? Now, climate change is not the topic today, but climate change is the example of what happens when the efforts of people exceed the natural limits. Climate change did not happen. It was not sent by heaven and earth. It was caused by people. And one of the byproducts of the pandemic was to see what happened when Oh, social distancing and staying at home and lockdown orders actually led to a decline in pollution levels. Well, didn't that show that we can affect that, that it came from us? It did not come from heaven and earth. So what kind of work will you do? Will you find work that keeps within the natural limits? Or will you have the ambition to create things that go beyond the natural limits? And when they go beyond the natural limits, you risk unbalancing what is healthiest for everybody. Think about all the events in the world today. Think about the events in say the last thousand years. What kind of errors did we commit in terms of unbalancing everything that is naturally so? So as you think about cultivating a life of Tao, you want to think about purifying yourself, cultivating yourself, but you also want to think about your social responsibility, which is to give to others, to be unselfish, to help other people. And you want to think about the livelihood that you might consider entering. Is it something that is within the natural limits? Or is it something that is going to lead to imbalance? And in that imbalance might you inadvertently be creating a new misfortune, perhaps for yourself, perhaps for other people. You see, good fortune and misfortune don't just happen. They aren't just accidents. 
They're the judgments of cumulative circumstances that come your way. And if those circumstances are human generated, then that meant that it was tragic in the sense of being unnecessary. But do you see, we leave so many people to do selfish things in the world. We idolize making money, going faster, having prettier things. All that has pushed us beyond what was naturally bound for us. And that has led to our own world misfortune as well. What's the end result of all of this? Change is not just something that happens to you. Change is something that you can create and you can participate in. Everything about the Taoist classics is about change. What does change mean, by the way? As long as something is in a different place, has moved, then it's changed, hasn't it? It's not just about something changing shape. It could be changing position, changing time, and so on. It's all about change. If you look at Tao and you had to find one way to summarize it, it would be movement. Everything moves. Every subatomic particle, every galaxy, everything moves. Therefore, everything is changing. Every minute of your life is changing. Can you participate in that change? And then, can you make change yourself? And so, in a time of pandemic, in a time of lockdown, in a time where it's possible that we might be coming out of this pandemic, although we're not quite sure, it's an opportunity to engage in change, your personal change, social change. And if you can cultivate yourself, if you can keep following Tao, then the changes will be proper because you will work for change that fits within the natural limits of what's given to you each day. And when you do that, will the world be made better? I think it will be. And I think that's what the classics promise us. Every page of every classic is meant to change you. They're trying to persuade you to be a better person. So if all these people who are now passed away, who had no possible gain in writing this down, can give us this gift, then we can emulate them. We can live pure lives. We can give to others. We can not just look at ourselves, but look at our role in our community. And we can be positive agents of change. So that's my view in answer to the question that was put to me. And I understand that there might be questions and answers. I'd be happy to engage in that. I'm not sure if any questions have come in, but I'll give you a moment and Sam, maybe you can guide us here. Yeah, so we'll do it just like we did this morning for folks that were here, just drop uh, uh, some questions in the chat um, and then we'll kind of get to them one by one. Definitely appreciated uh, this talks, the way it kind of tied in with the morning's talk as well. You know, Josh mentioned the concept in Taoism of this kind of karma, not just being from previous lives, but our families or our communities and in your talk you addressed how you know our self-cultivation is not just a passive process but also an active process and so not only are we doing that for ourselves but for generations to come uh, and so i really wanted to 
re repeat that point because I thought it was a really good one. Um, so we'll just go one by one and people can kind of keep going here. Um, Rich asked, uh, you used the word pure numerous times. And could you please expand on this from a Taoist point of view? What is pure? Yeah, it, the word that I'm referring to is um, in the I Ching, and it really translates, they usually translate that to chaste. Um, but that I don't know that that helps very much. And it's a picture of uh, divination. So when you divine, when you go through that ritual, you're supposed to approach it in a very pure and sincere way. Now, can I point out that purity in a human being really means a kind of balance? Because at any moment, you have good stuff and bad stuff in you, right? If you didn't um, eat, if you didn't have, sorry, anything to eliminate, you wouldn't really be doing well. But we have a point of balance of homeostasis. And when everything is balanced, that the good is just a little bit better than the bad, and you can keep going and so on, then I would submit to you that that's the um, state of physical purity. What does it mean to have mental purity? Does it mean you only think good things? I would suggest to you it's the same, that you have a balance. Because everybody has good and bad thoughts, sacred and profane thoughts. It doesn't stand to reason that purity means that we eliminate one side. Because just as the world only understands beauty because of ugliness, you're not going to attain purity by only clinging to one side of the equation. So it's balance and maybe a balance where the good slightly outweighs the bad. This is why we have to cultivate ourselves so that we're not undermined by faults that we are either unaware of or we refuse to do anything about. We practice to eliminate all our faults. It's not possible, I understand that, but at least we have to try. And if we can come to a balance between good and bad within ourselves, then that is a kind of mental purity. Have you ever noticed, by the way, that none of us have a single point of view? We have our intellects, we have our intuition, we have our emotions, we have our memories, and they all seem to be jumbled together in a big mess. And we have to wrest from this pile of feelings and thoughts some course of action during each day. We're not a single thing. And so it would be a mistake to think that purity means we are one thing. No, purity means that you attain a state of balance and therefore harmony between all the different sides of yourselves. Now, traditionally, purity of spirit would mean something else. And they would, the masters would point out emptiness as a state of purity in terms of our spiritual selves. And what would that mean? It would mean putting aside all your foibles, all the question of balance, this and that and so on, and merging completely with Tao. If you're empty, then you can let Tao flow through you. If you're full, if you say purity is only me balancing left and right and so on, there's not even room for Tao to come in. In China, a lot of doors have two leaves. Two, they open like this. Well, no matter how you define it, let's say one door is bad and one door is good. If you only alternate between the doors, the doors are closed. And then how can Tao come in? So on a spiritual or meditative level, can you open the two sides of those doors and just be a doorway 
and Tao can then come in. So I don't know that there's any single answer to that question. I think it's a sequence of steps that you have to go through. Thank you for that uh, detailed answer. Uh, Bradley uh, wants to ask, is there truly such a thing as wasted time? Sometimes worry that we wasted so much time in life, but wondering if there is some hidden advantage there, as you spoke of. Can we make a distinction between times in which you have to be fallow and times in which you actively are, say, abusing what you have? Now, I'm sorry, I'm not that disciplined. I spend a lot of time fooling around every day too. And I'm probably watching too many K-dramas and, you know, sitting too long eating and like, oh, I'll just have another cup of tea. But sometimes I really have to do that. Sometimes I come up against a conundrum in my work or my writing and I just have to like take a walk because I can't figure it out. So sometimes you need space look at every Chinese word. It consists of strokes, yes, but those strokes enclose spaces. So if you just have to define active and inactive time, you need both. But can you waste time in a way that is active and improper? And so can I point out this? It's a little gloomy. None of us knows when we're going to die. So we only have so much time left. Sometimes I think that being born is like being born with a bank account and you never know what the balance is. You don't know when you're going to die. So can you use your time wisely? And if you use your time unwisely, I think that's a problem. So instead of saying wasted time, can we say time used unwisely? And by the way, there's another aspect. It's not just, oh, I didn't do anything, or I sat there by the side of the road for three hours when it could have been two. There's time that's invested badly. There's time that is going to thwart you. There's time that is going to betray you. You can invest either in good activities or in activities that are going to come back and undermine you. I'll give you an example that's very personal. I had a lot of uncles who were alcoholics. They spent, a, well, I won't say a lot of time, every night drinking, every night. Bars, home, parties, banquets. Do you know every one of my cousins is ruined? Every one of my cousins knows that horrible feeling of like, oh, I have to drag dad out of the restaurant and take him to the car so he can sleep. Oh, there's dad again, drunk and angry. I would submit to you that's wasted time because it's an investment in negativity. They all died, of course, you know, uh, and not pleasantly so. They ruined their families and they never realized very much about themselves and we didn't talk about this in terms of self-cultivation but isn't that necessary to understand what you're doing in this world and why and if you spend your time drinking or doing drugs you're never going to realize that so i'm not referring to wasting time like i'm just sitting there or i need to take a walk or whatever neither am i supporting a kind of puritanical um, aesthetic where unless you're working every day you're no good and I'll tell you another story in a minute 
but I am talking about time in which you actively invest in undermining yourself and the people around you. Is it good to work all the time? No, that's not good either. And I'll tell you another personal story. My mother, who's now passed away, grew up in a garment factory. And she said the last thing she saw every night was her mother at a sewing machine. And the first thing she saw every morning was her mother at the sewing machine. Is that good? Is that somehow avoiding the stigma of wasted time? I will tell you that my mother made herself get up at 5.30 in the morning every day, no matter what. And she did that even when she was dying. And I begged her to sleep because maybe she would live longer and she couldn't. She still had to make herself get up every day at 5.30 just so, in, in my interpretation, she could consider herself a good person. So before we just so blithely talk about wasted time, I think we have to look at that carefully and we ought not to assume that someone who never wastes time is somehow better too. We're back to that first question, balance. You have to have balance. Thank you for those uh, personal examples and um, bringing that full circle again. Uh, Robert is asking, Master Dung, thank you for giving us this wonderful talk. I would like to ask Taoists to believe that the interior landscape of an individual spirit connects to the outer world. Can you please expand a bit on how our internal cultivation can generate external change in our environment? Well, I'm not sure I can explain it. I think the attitude is that somehow when a person is good and pure, it emanates outward. And I don't see a mechanism that is detailed in the classics. They just assume that if you're a good person, everything else will be good. And I'm not sure that I've gotten to that level of faith yet. I'm still trying to figure that out. But, you know, the premise of the question was the interior landscape. And if you look at some woodcuts, you can see that they portray the inside of a person as a landscape. And that brings up the question of micro and macro. And the Taoists, and maybe all of Chinese culture, assumes that everything is a set of nesting realities. So the land, our interior landscape matches the exterior landscape, and so on, right? That means then that there is no, that everything is nestled. It's not horizontal, that people aren't like sets of things on a stage, which is how we usually think of things. Well, what if we're a kind of projection of the outside and the outside is a projection of the inside? So ask yourself, is there a meaning to the events and circumstances in your lives? Are they quote meant for you? Is something writing a story for you and you're walking through the world, you, your personal actor in your own movie on your own stage? Or is somehow everything a concentric set of realities? And now here we have to be careful because of course we don't want to be egotistical and no, nobody is the center of the world and yet each person is the center of their world. Do you know what I mean? You can't assume that you are the most important thing in the world because none of us are. And yet from your own subjective viewpoint, all you have is yourself and the world around you. Is it somebody else's job to fix things? Oh, those creeps in Washington? Or is it your job? 
So I think when you change and purify yourself, because everything is a concentric set of realities, you change and purify the outer world. If you need a more conventional example, I think you inspire other people. I work in, you know, corporate settings sometimes. And one of the things that drives me crazy is when some executive will hand down some horrible decision and then they'll wait two weeks and they'll say, oh, nobody pushed back. And so they go ahead with it. Now, there's a contradiction because everyone else is told, oh, just do what the boss says. So when are you going to speak up? Now, you have to always speak up. There's an interesting situation if you study Chinese history, and it does apply to the pandemic. In Chinese history, there are all sorts of people who spoke up and then were struck dead by what they said. One of the early sages in, in um, the emperor's court spoke up and the emperor got irritated with it and says, oh, I hear a sage has more openings in their heart than a normal person. Let's cut his heart open and see and had his heart cut out in the middle of court. But you know what? For a Chinese kid, you're supposed to do that. You're taught to do that. You're taught to stand up for what you believe, even if it means dying. So same thing with the pandemic. Do you stand up for what you believe? Or do you just like, oh my God, I have to stay home and wash my hands. Not when you're trained to stand up for what you think is right, even if it means you die. So, what do you believe? And do you stand up and say something? And the problem today is, we think, oh, I want to win. Oh, I should only say something if everyone applauds me and says, oh, how right you are. But we don't like to stand up and say what we think is true and everyone puts us down. We're not very good at that. That's the real question, isn't it? Not can you affect the world, but are you afraid to try? You can't be afraid to try. And whether you win or prevail or not is not the measure of how successful you are. The question is, did you do it? Did you stand up for what you think is right? So now if Tao is like a river and we're supposed to go with the flow, why are we supposed to stand up and say what's right? And I'll tell you one of the lessons I have with my master. Um, we went to Niagara Falls because we never, he never saw Niagara Falls. And there was a rock, a stone in the river. And he says, See, if there's a stone there, the water has to flow around it. If you take the stone away, then the current of the river changes. Sometimes we have to stand up and be the stone, and then the river will flow around us. But that's only right when you take the correct and moral position. And we haven't talked about morality, you know, today. But you are supposed to be ethical and moral. Stand up for what you think is right. First, practice and train so you understand what is truly ethical and moral. And then advocate that in your community. And remember, the measure is not whether you're wildly successful or whether you're praised or famous for it. The measure is whether you stood up or not. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, the next question we have here is from Maria. 
Master Dung, thank you for your illuminating talk. Do you personally practice or recommend any kind of still meditation to cultivate emptiness apart from Qigong or martial arts? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. You have to. You have to. Yes, you should. I, I don't want to be a broken record, but you have to meditate every day. And here's what I've been doing personally. Um, I started meditating in the middle of the day. And speaking of what we're talking about, wasted time and so on. You know, I need, I'm need. i self-employed. So if I don't work, my family doesn't eat. And I already told you about my mother and grandmother. I come from a, a family where, yeah, you're supposed to work all the time. But I realized I started doing everything by momentum. Like... I got to work harder. I have to do this faster. I have to get this done. I have to meet this deadline. And then I just realized, I, you know, half of my effort was just like going Ugh! and not really being thoughtful about my work. The good thing about meditating in the middle of the day is it disrupted all of that. First of all, it goes against that idea that, oh, you have to work harder and faster, harder, faster, harder, faster because I wasn't actually being as productive. And returning to emptiness in the middle of the day means you get to reset everything and calm down and really come back and see the world as it is. So I, th I think it's really important when learning martial arts and Qigong to be technical, to understand all the details. And I do think that Qigong and martial arts are really important to practice. I've been practicing for 47 years now. And I wouldn't be here without it. I wouldn't be able to manage my health without it. I wouldn't be sane without it. But meditation is really important. And one would say it's even the culmination of all those practices. That if, in theory, if you could... Um, just meditate. If you had to choose meditation over martial arts and Qigong, you should choose meditation. That's not really a, a proper choice because they all go together, but that's how important it is. So yes, please do practice meditation. Awesome. I think the last question we have currently in the chat is from, and I <laughs> correct me, I know a private message if I'm saying it wrong, Senetica. Uh, saying thank you really to Master Dung. I would like to ask about becoming a uh, public political person because even if I were to help people in a public way, I consider it very dangerous to be inside the political world um, and while at the same time trying to follow the Tao. And I know that Taoist masters in this question states, Taoist masters were uh, refused to be inside the political structure and they would be more counselors outside of the structure. Oh, so, what was our question? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think it. Let's see. Um, Me meaning, should she enter politics, or that's how I'm taking it? And you can drop it in the chat if uh, if I'm not interpreting that correctly. I I don't see a way to directly apply, say, the Taoist principles of the Tao Te Ching to being a politician. Um, and so one wonders whether it was possible to be Taoist in the sense of the Tao Te Ching and be in political office. Can we remember, if you accept this origin story, that Lao Tzu got tired of the world and left Right, and he noticed he was not a ruler; he was a keeper of the of the historical archives. Even so, you could argue that a vast amount of the Tao Te Ching is advice to a ruler. But you see, a ruler didn't write that book, and in his time, in Lao Tzu's time no ruler undertook his ideas for uh, their politics. 
And in fact, we know after that time, it was the War in States period, which was more than two and a half centuries of constant warfare. So obviously the ideas didn't take then either. So the first question is, maybe it's a contradiction to be a Taoist and a politician, and maybe the only possible solution is as an advisor. So if you look at the three pure ones, the Taoist Trinity as an example, there's the Jade Emperor who is the ruler, there's the original being who is retired, but there for advice. And there's Lao Tzu, who's there for advice too. Do you see, there might be a contradiction between being an actual ruler and having this wisdom. And so maybe the only way is to um, have it be in between. Now, were there Taoist politicians? Yeah, historically, yes. Did they... Um, have an effect? Yes. So, for example, the way of the Celestial Masters, they actually uh, established a theocracy in what's now Sichuan province. So, yeah. But did they commit other problems and excess in rebellion? Yeah. So, if you th can we just cut to the chase and say there is no paradise possible, right? There's, again, it's balance. And so, on one hand, if this person is looking for a role for between Taoist ideals and political presence, it would have to be, can we call it, indirect. Now, I will make one caveat, and I'm using this, I'm about to use this word metaphorically, because I'm not sure that I really believe it as a kind of external force. Different people have different destinies. Some people are really talented at martial arts or medicine. Some people can play music in a way that I could never hope to do. Some people are rich and beautiful and famous. And sorry, some people are wretched and ugly and poor. Some people are good at planting. And some people are good at computer science. So it's theoretically possible that somebody could be destined or really good at being a politician. In fact, isn't that what we hope for? That somebody is good and reputable and charismatic and energetic and that by acclamation we elect that person. Now, theoretically, it is possible to be that kind of person, yes? I'm not, I'm not one of them. You can't make that happen. You can't um, manufacture that kind of person. It just happens in their life. And if so, if that kind of person can have an understanding of Tao, that would be really wonderful. What that would mean is that that person would have to be able to work with the circumstances and not be selfish. And by the way, I think you could accuse so many American politicians of just exactly that problem. Selfish. And you can explain all their excesses and their inactivity even, or their irrational policies as being selfish. We expect our public servants not to be selfish. We ask our policemen and our um, military to sacrifice themselves. Socially, we benefit by people being selfless. But we don't hold our politicians to that. And we ought to. So, if somebody has the fortune of being in the right place at the right time, of having the talent and the connections to be a politician, and they're interested in Taoism, yes, in theory, it would be a wonderful thing. All right, we have one more question uh, in the chat from Serena. 
who loved your comments on standing up for what you believe in. I've been trying to reconcile the idea of going with the flow in life with effective change through activism, especially within environmental issues like climate change and pollution. Can one still be outspoken in speaking up or is it better to live by a more quiet revolution through example in action? Uh, or as often with these questions, is it both? How can we best serve our communities through positive change, especially when it goes against the status quo? For example, with a woman's right to vote in the 19th or 20th centuries. Can I ask this? Should we be caught up in the idea of success or not success? So the Supreme Court made this ludicrous ruling. Sorry, that's my opinion. Um, is that a setback? Or is that simply a circumstance in which we need to assert ourselves? So what if we see everything not as good and bad, winning and losing, but just as something that happened? And then we do need to make an effort and everyone has to choose the level of effort that they want to put out. You have to choose what works for you and you have to choose also look at what's effective. I'm going to give you a minor example that is intentionally outside of politics. I know two sculptors. They're excellent world-class sculptors. Their sculptures are all over the place in San Francisco and the Bay Area in the world and so on. But they long to be painters. They're not very good painters. Their sculptures are way better than their paintings, but they just want so much to be painters. We have to look at what we're successful at doing. So you do stand up, you do go out, but then you have to see whether you have whatever it is, that, what it takes to affect people. And you have to find the level of what's comfortable for you. Maybe it's making contributions, maybe it's fundraising, maybe it is being, you know, going door to door to get votes. Maybe it is running for office. Okay, you have to see what works for your life. Right, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is this is why we have to talk about morality and ethics. Because if you're going to take a position, don't you want to have the confidence and faith that it's, quote, right? And if you compare it to all that we are taught about what is moral and ethical, and you take your position and find that it's the correct one, then it isn't a question of winning or losing. It's a question of being correct. And we are told this all the time in the classics. What is rectitude? What is correctness? Can you be correct? And as a metaphor, the word for correct Every line meets at a right angle. It's not slanted, not circular, right? It's just bang, right? Everything is correct. If you take a position in life that you deem correct, then yes, you need to stand up for it. You need to advocate it because who else is going to do it? You see, she may say, oh, no one's looking or I'm just one little person, what can I do? But she is there. And if everyone looks over and goes, oh my God, she's standing up. She's telling us that I never thought of that before. You see, the first thing anybody is going to ask is, does anyone else think so? So you need to be there. It's not a matter of will one person do what it takes a million to do. Don't think that. Maybe you standing up today only changed one mind. You have to be patient. And if you're correct, it's not a matter of winning or losing. 
It's a matter of standing up for a life that is correct. All right, that's that's all our questions okay. uh, in the chat box here. Thank you, Mingdao, for being here. Well, thank you. And again, it was my privilege and honor to be here. I wish you all well, and I hope to see you all again. Yeah, so just as a little housekeeping, tomorrow we'll be starting at the same time, um, you know, likely on the same schedule, waiting a few minutes for folks to come in. And uh, we have presenting in the morning, Shifu Joshua Yoon, um, who is behind the Taoist Center that we are uh, running this, that is running this uh, conference. And then we also have uh, Lindsay Wei in the afternoon. So in the afternoon at East Coast time. Uh, so Joshua Yoon is gonna be speaking on destiny and the role of the pandemic, understanding the zodiac cycles and things like that and the political structure. And then Lindsay will be talking about Zhenwu the, as a representative figure for Wudong Taoism and for martial arts. Um, so two really, another two really exciting talks and we're really looking forward to them. So uh, thank you all for being here and I hope uh, to see you know many of you tomorrow as well. So uh, signing off.